Hello, welcome to the Voice of Triumph. My name is Ugochukwe Bazo. It's a beautiful Sunday morning, and I'm sure God has a word for you to take you from where you are to where God wants you to be. Um, it's possible you're working today. Get your colleagues together. Let's go right into the Word. Are you on transit? Connect with us. Let's go right into the Word. You're home already? Get your family together. Let's go into the Word of God. Uh, today we're looking at the last two of the nine fruit of the Spirit, or uh, nine fruit of the Holy Spirit. We've been looking at the first seven, and it's been a great time. Praise God. And um, I began in this series by explaining to us that part of this study is first of all to recognize the things we've been freely given in Christ Jesus, the fruit we have in our born again spirit, and how you and I can begin to use the fruit we have in our born again spirit. Let's begin with the word. In the first part of this series, we looked at the fact that you and I are triune beings. In other words, you're primarily a spirit, you have a soul, where you have your will, your emotions, and your mind, and you live in a house called your body to enable you function in this material world. We saw that in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 where he says that out of the, the dust of the ground God f formed man, that's the body, and then put in him the breath or the spirit of life, that's the, the human spirit, the real you, the inner man, and then man became a living soul. Again we established in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 where Paul began to pray that you preserve, you're preserved, your spirit, soul, and body becomes preserved unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we established that and as we went on in the series, we also saw that the moment you got born again, it was an experience in your spirit man, in your inward man or your heart or your inner man. All of this described the spirit man. It was an experience in your spirit man. You became brand new in your spirit man or in your heart or your inward man or inner man. You became brand new. Again, we established that not only did the Holy Spirit give birth to this brand new you in your, in your spirit man, the Holy Spirit now resides in your spirit man. He lives in your spirit man and he imparted fruit, praise God, into your born again spirit. He imparted fruit into your born again spirit and this fruit constitutes part of your divine nature. Because if you're born again, you, you are now a partaker of the divine nature. Because now you have the life and the nature of God. And part of this nature that you have is um, the fruit of the Spirit. The nine fruit of the Spirit. And we've looked at seven of them. We're going to be looking at them in a nutshell now. So this fruit that you have in your born again spirit are part of your divine nature. And God wants you and I to begin to partake, praise God or to draw from this divine nature or from the nine fruit of the spirit that we have in our born again spirit and we also call them divine deposits to enable you and i live out the victorious life that jesus purchased for us on the cross by his own blood amen so god wants you and i to begin to partake of this divine nature part of which are the nine fruit of the spirit we see that in second peter chapter 1 verse 4 he says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by this you and I might become partakers of the divine nature. Can you see? Of the divine nature. Having, ex you know, having uh, um, escaped the corruption that's in this world through lust. By the way, we're looking at the, uh, the, the, the seventh part of partaking in your divine nature. I didn't say that at the beginning, partaking in your divine nature. Praise God. So we see that if you're born again, you have the divine nature, the nature of God, and part of this nature um, are the nine fruit of the Spirit, and God wants you to begin to partake of this nature, to begin to partake of the nine fruit of the Spirit. Now, how do we know that there are nine fruit of the Spirit? Of the Spirit? We saw that in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Let's read that. He said, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there's no law. When you look at it, there are actually nine of them. And we've looked at seven of them. We've looked at love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Today we're looking at meekness and temperance. Meekness and temperance. Praise God. So are you ready? Let's go. 
Remember, these are divine deposits already in your born again spirit. God is not promising to give you any one of these. God's not promising to give you love or peace or joy. No, you already, he put all of that in, in your born again spirit the moment you got saved. Why? So you can use them. You can partake of them. You can partake in them. You can draw from them when you need them. Praise God. For example, um, when the whole world around you is, 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 is chaotic, when the environment is tensed and everybody's agitating and the world is living in fear, you can draw from the deposit of peace in your, in your heart. You can draw from the deposit of peace in your born again spirit because the peace of God is already there. And so you can draw from it in a way that would make your world wonder the kind of human being you are because everybody is afraid everybody's agitated but you have such peace in the midst of it why because you're 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 partaking in your divine nature you're drawing from the deposit of peace the peace of god in your born again spirit that's how we ought to be living we can't be agitated like the people of the world the reason we do that is because we haven't learned how to draw from the deposit of the peace of god in our heart or in our born again spirit or inner man or inward man praise god hallelujah so let's begin with meekness today meekness is one of the fruit of the spirit that you already have if you're born again in your heart on your born again spirit it's no longer a promise from god it's already part of your spiritual reality is then your born again spirit spirit waiting for you to tap into it waiting for you to begin to partake in it or waiting for you to begin to draw from it praise god so it can affect your life and the outside praise god hallelujah and i'm going to be reading out a lot of the things that i wrote here amen so we're looking at meekness today now the word meekness takes its root from the word humus or humility humus or humility so another word for meekness is humility that's why sometimes many translations rather than use meekness we use humility even it takes this word from the root word humus or humility and when you look at the prophecy of our lord jesus christ one of the ways that you know he, he was described even before he came bodily was meekness he was described as the meek one praise god that tells you how precious meekness is to god and should be to you and i that tells you why god imparted that fruit meekness in your born again spirit the moment you got born again let's look at some of those prophecies zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 i'm reading the amplified translation that talked about you know our lord jesus has been meek before he came even before he came praise god zechariah chapter 9 and i'm reading verse 9 i'm reading the amplified translation quickly look at what it says it says rejoice greatly O daughter of zion shout aloud O daughter of jerusalem behold your king comes to you he is uncompromisingly just and having salvation triumphant and victorious patient meek meek can you see that Amen. So it tells us that Jesus had this fruit of the Spirit called meekness. Praise God. Meek, lowly, and riding on a donkey upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. Praise God. So we see this prophecy of meekness concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. That can also be your testimony. Praise God. It can be my testimony. If we know how to draw from this divine deposit called meekness or this fruit of the Spirit called meekness in our born again spirit. Let's look at another prophecy, Isaiah 61, verse 1, to, concerning his ministry to you and I. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Look at what the Bible says concerning his ministry to you and to me. Now look at this. Isaiah 61, verse 1. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Wow. So there's something about being meek or living out the meekness of God that make, transforms your life, that makes you a candidate for divine, divine secrets. Praise God. That's what he says here, that he will preach the good tidings to the meek, to the meek. Can you see that? He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So he says, Jesus says, the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good tidings to the meek, to the meek, not to uh, just everyone. To the meek can you see that so there's something gracious about living out the meekness of god praise god remember if you're born again meekness is no longer a promise it's your reality you have this meekness of god hallelujah in your born again spirit 
praise God. And then, of course, let's look at the test. This is we've seen the prophecies of our Lord Jesus, and let's look at the testimony that Jesus Himself gave concerning Himself. Amen. Let's look at the testimony that Jesus Himself gave concerning Himself. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Look at what it says concerning Himself. Matthew eleven twenty nine. You know, agreeing or corroborating the prophecies about Himself, about the meekness in His life. Jesus Himself testified of himself concerning it. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Look at what Jesus says. He says, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek. So the prophecies said he was coming as the meek one and then he comes and he corroborates and agrees with the prophecies. He says, for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest unto your soul. So Jesus testifies of himself as the meek one the one who was living out the meekness of God in his life. Praise God. Hallelujah. So I have this written. Amen. Beloved, the humility of our Lord Jesus was imparted into our born again spirit or heart the moment we made him the Lord and Savior of our lives. Now let me say this to you, just like I wrote here, that the meekness and the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of course the meekness and the humility of God himself, was imparted into your born again spirit the moment you got saved that's why i told you that meekness is no longer a promise for you it's your reality in your born again spirit waiting for you to draw from it so it, it can begin to define your life on the outside so you can begin to influence influence and impact the world around you so the meekness of jesus christ praise god was imparted into your born again spirit the moment you got saved and of course this was an act of the holy spirit Amen. And I have this written. All we need to do is to train our minds to be able to draw from this resource of meekness or humility in our born again spirit. How? By spending quality time in God's word and in fellowship with him. In other words, the more we spend time in the word of God, the more we fellowship with the spirit of, of God, the more we can draw, praise God, from this reservoir of weakness, of meekness that we have in our born again spirit. The more we can draw from the reservoir of this divine deposit called humility or weakness, that meekness, sorry, that we already have in our born again spirit. Because it's already there. Amen. There's something about fellowship. The more you fellowship with a person, the more the, their nature and their character and their personality begins to rub upon you. And because our Lord Jesus is the meek one, and God is the meek one as well, the more we fellowship with His Word, the more we fellowship with His precious Holy Spirit, the more this meek nature of God begins to rub off on us. The more this meek nature of Jesus Christ begins to rub off on us, the more we look like Him, the more we talk like Him, the more His personality begins to rub off on us. That's what we're saying. Praise God. That the more we spend time in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, through the Word, through prayer, the more we can draw from the reservoir of meekness or humility that we have in our born again spirit. Amen. And God gives you and I an admonition, which is very important. He gives us an admonition in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 4. So remember, if you're born again, you have the ability to live out a life of humility. You have the ability to live out the life of meekness that God called you and I to live because he put his very own meekness. He put this ability in your born again spirit. He imparted the fruit of meekness, humility in your born again spirit. Praise God. Hallelujah. You don't have to beg for it. It's already yours. You just draw from it. Hallelujah. And let it begin to define your life on a daily basis. Now look at God's admonition to you and I. First Peter chapter 3 verses 3 and 4. First Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Look at what it says concerning it. First Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. It says, it says, um, it says, um, who's adorning, even though Peter, but the Holy Spirit was speaking to women, but of God, of course, is a lesson for you and I, is a principle for you and I. It says, who's adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of the platinum of hair, and of the wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man. Remember? The hidden man or the, the born again spirit man or the heart. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. In that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek, of a meek and quiet spirit. 
which in the sight of God is of great price. Now, you know, God begins to speak to you, to you and I, even though Peter in this instance was talking to the women and saying to the women, what you should be concerned about is, is not what you wear from the outside on yourself. The, the beautiful hair you, 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 you do, God's not against it. God wants you to look nice and really good to, to the glory of his name. You know, um, the beautiful clothing, the jewels, and all of that. God is not against them. Praise God. God is not against them. He wants you to look good, nice all the time. But what Peter was saying by the Holy Spirit was, that shouldn't become what defines you. What defines you shouldn't be the things you wear from the outside, the clothing, the nice hairdo, and all of that. What should define you? is the meekness you have in your born again spirit that you allow to cover your life on the outside praise god like the clothing like the apparel like the jewels and like the beautiful hair so peter was saying that when you allow the meekness in your born again spirit to begin to cover your life on the outside outside like the clothes you wear like the beautiful gold the gold and the silver and all the things you wear then of course you begin to live out the glory of god that's what Peter is saying here by the Holy Spirit. But the focus here is God is telling us to allow the meekness we have in our born again spirit to begin to rule and govern our lives on the outside. To become what identifies us. To become what defines your identity. Not the gold you wear. Not the beautiful hairdo. Not a beautiful apparel. All those are nice. But God said, let the meekness in your born again spirit begin to dominate your life on the outside. So it becomes what defines you. Praise God. It becomes what gives you an identity. That's what God is saying to us here. That's God's admonition to me and to you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because we are called to a life of meekness just like our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you see a proud Christian, when you see a man or woman who is born again and still living in pride, it is either because they are ignorant of who they are on the inside and the fact that meekness has become part of their divine nature or they are just not willing to allow who they are on the inside to begin to rule their lives on the outside. That's the truth. Amen. The more we become conscious of the divine deposit of meekness that we have on the inside, the more we become conscious of the fact that the meekness of God, the meekness of our Lord Jesus Christ, has already been poured and imparted into our born again spirit, waiting to begin to rule our lives on the outside. The more it changes the way we live, the more we are determined to draw from it and to live out this life on the outside by this meekness that we have been given. Now I have this written. It is often said that the closer we are to God, the more ordinary we become the meeker we become. Praise God. I mean, look at the testimony of Moses. Amen. Moses was a man who walked with God. And the Bible described him as the meekest man on earth. As the meekest man on earth. Wow. You know, he was, he was the meekest man on earth. I, I like that to be, you know, I'm sure you want that to be your testimony. Numbers 12, chapter 12, verse 3. He said, now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth above all the men who, who were upon the face of the earth so you can understand why Moses had such a profound work with God because he was a meek man amen there's something about meekness hallelujah that draws you you know uh, that draws you to the heart of God Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we said it is often said that the closer we are to God, the meeker we become, the more ordinary we become because his nature begins to rub off on us. And let me say that humility is not just an attitude. Meekness is not just a good attitude. It is one of the greatest spiritual forces. The more we allow it to rule our lives, the more we experience the grace of of God. The more we allow this meekness in us, this humility within us to rule our lives, to govern our lives, the more we experience the grace of God. Hallelujah. In other words, meekness is a recipe for the experience of the grace of God. Meeker people experience more grace. Humbler people experience more grace than proud people. 
and it's scriptural. Praise God. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. Amen. First Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Look at what it says. It says, Likewise, you younger ones, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with meekness or humility. Be clothed with it. Why? Because it's already inside you. Let it come out from inside you and cover you like a dress. That's what God is saying here. Praise God. Be clothed with humility or meekness. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the meek or the humble. So meekness enables you to experience greater dimensions of grace. Praise God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So remember, meekness is already part of your new nature. You are not begging for it. You are not praying for it. It's already there, waiting for you to draw from it. So you can live out this life of meekness and humility. So that the world can see the meekness of Jesus Christ through your life, through my life. And so that we can bring glory to God all the time. Praise God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now the last fruit of the Spirit I want us to look at today is temperance. I want us to look at today is temperance. Temperance. Hallelujah. And this is very, very critical. Living out this fruit of the Spirit is very important, especially in the times we're living in. We're living in the very, very last of days. And you and I need temperance. If you and I are going to stay focused, are going to live out the will and the plan and purpose of God for our lives, especially as we approach the end of this age. Amen. And again, like I said, temperance is no longer a promise from God. It's part of your divine nature, waiting for you to tap into it, waiting for you to draw from it, waiting for you to begin to partake in it. It's already part of your new nature. Praise God. Hallelujah. I have something written here. Another word for temperance is discipline, self-control, or self-governance. Temperance means discipline, self-control, self-governance. Our Lord Jesus is a God of discipline. Our Lord Jesus is a God of temperance. Amen? And the moment we got saved, this quality from Him was imparted into our born-again spirit by His precious Holy Spirit. So that's what we're saying here. Amen? That our Lord Jesus is, is a temperate, is a temperate Lord. Our God is a temperate God. Amen. Temperance is the nature of God. It's the personality of God. I mean, think about it. If God wasn't a disciplined God, you and I would have been gone. I mean, many times we provoked him to anger before we knew him, before we got saved. Many times we lived in disobedience, in disrespect for him. And yet each time he constrained himself, he constrained himself because our God is a temperate God. He's a disciplined God. And so it is with Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus said something that I wish I could find here. Jesus one day said, look, I have so many things to say to you. But I discipline myself to say only the things I hear my father say. Can you see that? You can imagine the amount of self-governance that Jesus displayed, lived by, lived with. You can imagine the level of discipline that Jesus exhibited. You know, think about it, that in all of the oppositions from the, the religious leaders of Israel, from all of the oppositions, from the enemy, Jesus still constrained himself only to say what the Father permitted him to say. To do only what the Father permitted him to do. That's discipline. So you can understand why Jesus was successful in his ministry. Amen? So our Lord Jesus is a disciplined one. And this quality, this quality, this quality was imparted into your born again fruit of the Spirit the moment you got saved, the moment I got saved. In other words, we have been empowered by the ability to live out the discipline of our Lord Jesus Christ. To live exactly the same kind of disciplined life He did. That's true. Praise God. Because the, the fruit of temperance that was in Him, while he walked here physically, is now in you and I, if we are born again, because we're born again. That same ability that enabled him to live out a life of discipline, that enabled him to live a life of self-control, has been 
given to us. That same ability has been imparted into our born again spirit so that you and I can live like him. Praise God. Hallelujah. So that's what we're saying, that this quality of our Lord Jesus Christ, temperance, discipline, self-control, was imparted into our born again spirit the moment we got saved. As a believer, you do not lack discipline or self-government. You don't lack it. It's already there inside you. Amen. What you may be lacking is the will to exercise what you have already been given. So we're saying that if you're born again, you do not lack discipline. You do not lack temperance. You do not lack self-control. It's already within you. Amen. It was imparted into your spirit by the Holy Spirit the moment you got born again. What you and I may be struggling with, you know, is the will. The will to live out who we are on the inside. The will to draw from the discipline, the temperance that we already have in our born again spirit, in our heart or in our inward man. That's what I'm saying here. You see, it's important that you recognize the difference between the things that God promises to give to you and the things that God has already given to you in Christ. The things that God promises to give to you, you can ask him for those things. But the things that you've already been given, you don't ask for them. You exercise yourself in them so that you can grow in them. Praise God. And one of them is discipline. God has already given us discipline in our born again spirit. So we don't go to God and say, God, give me discipline. He would say, what else do you want me to do? I put discipline as a fruit of the spirit the moment you got born again. Use it. Draw from it. Allow it to govern your life on the outside. And that's what this study is meant to be doing for you and for me. Sometimes I hear Christians say things like, well, when it comes to food, I can't help myself. I can't control myself. When it comes to sleep, I can't help myself. I can't control myself. That's not true. You can. Amen. And I can. I can control myself in whatever part of life it is. And you can as well if you're born again. The challenge is, it's either we didn't know that discipline is part of our divine nature, that the fruit of self-control is already within us, or even when we knew, we didn't have the will to exercise it, to live it out. We're still waiting for God to come and do it for us. Amen? So we have discipline in our born-again spirit as part of our divine nature. In fact, you have all the ability you need to rule your emotions, your tempers, your desires, your flesh, and to overcome every negative and destructive habit. You have the ability to overcome every single one of them. It's the fruit of discipline or temperance or self-government that God put in your born-again spirit the moment you got born again. Praise God. You have the ability to be focused. You have the ability to be consistent and committed in whatever you set out to do. That's the truth. You and I have been given the fruit of self-control, self-governance, so we can live it out. Praise God. Hallelujah. Again, I have this waiting. This consciousness will make you a master over your circumstances. In other words, the more conscious you and I become of the fact that temperance as a fruit of the Spirit is already within us, self-control as a fruit of the Spirit is already within us, the more we can govern our lives on the outside and the more we can become masters of our circumstances. Praise God. Amen. So what is God saying? Quit saying you can't control yourself. Stop saying it. You have been empowered in Christ to do it. Quit saying, stop saying you can't control yourself in anything. Stop saying it. You've been empowered in Christ to do it. The Bible says you and I can do all things, praise God, including exercise discipline and self-control over the circumstances of life. We can do all things. How? Through Christ who strengthens us. Where is Christ? In your born again spirit. Where's the anointing in your born again spirit? Praise God. It is part of the fruit of the spirit. Temperance, self control, self governance. Hallelujah. Now, why is discipline so critical in our walk with God? Why is discipline so critical in our walk with God? Let's look at that quickly. Number one, discipline or temperance, you know, self control, will protect you from vulnerability. It will protect you from being vulnerable. What are we saying? The truth is that the devil will only tempt you in areas where you do not have discipline. He will only tempt you in the areas of your weaknesses or lack of self-control or lack of self-governance. For example, 
if you do not have discipline with food, then it becomes an area where the devil can tempt you. If you do not have discipline with sleep, it becomes an area where he can distract you. That's what we're saying, that you are tempted in the areas of your weakness. You are tempted in the areas where you do not exercise discipline or temperance. But you see, when you and I begin to live out the discipline we have on the inside, the temperance we have on the inside as a fruit of the Spirit, then of course, the less vulnerable we become. The less vulnerable we become. It will protect us from vulnerability. That's why the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. James chapter 4, verse 7. You can resist him in the areas of your weakness. You resist him in the area of your strength. That's why you and I must recognize that we've been empowered to live above every kind of fleshly weakness there is. God has empowered us to exercise dominion and discipline over our emotions, our appetites, and whatever it is. We can govern ourselves, praise God, because self-government has been imparted into our born-again spirit. So the next time the enemy tells you, you can exercise discipline over food, over sleep, or whatever it is, tell him you can because you've been empowered with the discipline of our Lord Jesus Christ imparted into your born-again spirit as a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You see, the more you begin to acknowledge what you have, the more you, you can draw from it, the more it becomes your reality. And that's what, you know, the Bible says in Philemon chapter 1. Philemon has only one chapter, verse 6. It says that the communication of your faith might become effectual. How? By the acknowledging of every good thing, including temperance or discipline, that is already in you in Christ Jesus. Acknowledge that you have discipline. Acknowledge that you have self-control. Stop saying you don't have discipline or you can't discipline yourself here or in this area. Stop saying it. Acknowledge you have self-government within you. You have the ability to live out a life of discipline. The Bible says as you acknowledge it, your faith begins to rise to begin to live out the reality of it. Now, praise God. The second reason why discipline is or temperance is critical in our work with God is because it is a recipe for success. Think about it. You can't succeed in an area where you don't have discipline. Many people desire to succeed but do not have the discipline to do the things they need to do to succeed. Every success was founded, every true success has been founded on discipline. Anybody who wants to succeed in anything must begin with the fruit of discipline, must learn to govern themselves. It's a recipe, an infallible recipe for success. Praise God. Success and discipline go together. Praise God. Hallelujah. In other words, you and I can only succeed, succeed to the extent that we are disciplined. Amen? We can only succeed to the extent that we are disciplined. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. 1 Corinthians 9, 25. It talks about it. 1 Corinthians 9, 25. Look at what it says here. Amen? I read King James and maybe New Living Translation. Every man that strives for mastery, anyone who wants to be a master over anything, hallelujah, has to be temperate, disciplined in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we do it, we exercise temperance or discipline to get an incorruptible crown. New Living Translation, or let me read, um, 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 okay, New Living Translation. All athletes are disciplined in their training. So you can be a champion, an athlete champion, you can be a champion in, 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 in any field of athletics if you're not disciplined with your training. Wake up at 4 or 5 whilst everybody else is sleeping. You wake up in the morning. You train. When you study the lives of champions, they are people who are very disciplined with training. Very consistently disciplined with their training. That's why they become masters over, over their chosen fields. That's what we're saying here. That it takes discipline to succeed. It's the recipe for success. And finally, why is it important for us to be disciplined? Hallelujah. It's a requirement for leadership. You can't govern people without first governing yourself. As a leader, to succeed, you must first of all learn to govern yourself before you govern people. You must learn to lead yourself. And it takes discipline to do that before you can lead people. 
it's a recipe for leadership. It's a requirement for leadership. Titus 1, 7 and 8. Titus chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And I'm reading quickly the um, New American Standard Bible. Look at it. It says, For the overseer, in whatever form, must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, temperate, disciplined. It's a requirement for leadership. Praise God. I'm sure God has spoken to you. We've looked at the last two fruit of the Spirit, and, um, and I'm sure that it's been a great time. Remember, all of these are no longer promises from God. They are already part of your new nature, your divine nature, waiting for you to lift them out so you and I can live out the glorious life that God ordained for us from the foundations of the earth. Hallelujah. I have something written here. Begin today with a new consciousness of the meekness and discipline of our Lord Jesus Christ within you. Let it begin to rule and redefine and redirect your life on the outside. Remember, these are not just sound moral attitude. They are powerful spiritual forces that activate God's power, God's glory, and God's blessings in our lives. Praise God. Hallelujah. I do not want to close the broadcast without giving someone an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of their lives. Maybe that's why you tuned in in the first place. You want to surrender your life to Jesus. Can you say this after me? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart. You died for me. On the third day, God raised you from the dead. I, con I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again into the family of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. I welcome you. You said this prayer. Now, should you want us to pray with you, call any of the numbers on the screen. Our team of prayer warriors are standing by to join forces with you in prayer. Or should you want to share a testimony of the impact of this broadcast on your life or your family or your community, be free to call any of the numbers on the screen. We'll be glad to get back to you. Till we meet again, keep working in this consciousness. You're loaded with divine deposits waiting to be lived out on the outside so that you and I can become masters of the circumstances of this life. Your days of stagnation are over. Your days of defeat are over. I love you. Bye-bye.